even though there were a lot of areas where the first Zone of the Enders didn't deliver, I think it generally made good on its promise of high-speed robot action. I can't say that I didn't want more. I mean, I had the sequel anyway, I might as well get my money's worth on that HD collection, right? But let me tell you, if there's one thing I like more than a great game, it's a great sequel. And thank God, that's what Zone of the Enders The Second Runner was when it released back in 2003. We still have Kojima producing, and many of the same core team members, but original director Okamura was replaced with Shuyo Murata, the cinematic designer for the first game, and a close collaborator with Kojima, even to this day. In fact, Shuyo Murata was originally selected to direct Metal Gear Solid 4 before, uh... Fan outcry caused Kojima to change his mind. The story picks up two years later and follows an ex Barum soldier hiding out on the moon Callisto. For whatever reason, he's been given a very unfortunate name, and the characters love to say it without any sense of self-awareness. So how about you just take a listen? It's... Dingo! No, that's really what they went with. His name is Dingo Egret. It was a thing in Metal Gear for characters to have animal names, but they were clearly code names, and they never picked silly sounding animals like that. I, I don't get it, I know there's a lot of mecha characters with weird names. I think this was not the way they should have taken it though. Anyways, while on a mining expedition, Dingo locates the abandoned Jehuti just as Baram is closing in on it. Despite his best efforts to get revenge, he's taken prisoner and eventually left for dead when his former commander, Noman, shoots him for refusing to rejoin. However, his traitorous lieutenant, Ken Marineris, secretly hooks Dingo up to Jehuti for life support and sends him off to help the Space Force destroy Auman Fortress, the device Ada was built to destroy. The machine supplements your heart and lungs. That power comes from Jehuti. What? The minute you get off Jehuti, it will stop providing energy. You will die if you leave Jehuti. Oh, don't talk nonsense. Right off the bat, it's obvious that the Zoe 2 team set out to address as many of the original's criticisms as they possibly could. For starters, the structure has been completely changed, doing away with the world map and backtracking entirely in favor of a more traditional, linear style. Second Runner feels much more like a character action game with this kind of pacing, but the team needed to do a lot more than that to fix the problems. If this game was more linear but only had the same three enemies, then it would probably be a worse experience overall, but fortunately that's what the team really pulled through, packing the game with tons of new frames to fight that fill out the enemy complement perfectly. The team also made a few much appreciated changes to the combat. Fighting multiple enemies has been made significantly easier now that your burst shot can be used as a crowd clearing ability. That's something that the developers force you to learn almost immediately thanks to mosquitoes and mines. Sub weapons received a lot of changes, and pretty much all of my criticisms with them from the first game were addressed. You can use a button to access a menu of sub-weapons now, and freeze gameplay so you can actually think about what you want to use instead of scrolling through them in the middle of combat. To avoid accidentally grabbing enemies when you're too close, that ability's been made a sub-weapon in its own right, and its usefulness has been dramatically expanded. You can now move around while grabbing enemies, and even use them as makeshift shields before throwing them directly at locked-on targets. There's also environmental assets that can be picked up and used in place of enemies. This move is so useful that you can switch between it and your currently equipped subweapon just by tapping the menu button. Since the exploration's been done away with, subweapons are now received at various points in the story, or after beating bosses or certain enemies. Since the designers now know for certain when you're gonna have subweapons, at certain points, the encounters can be designed to take advantage of these new weapons and really force you to learn how to use them and see what they're good at doing. That's something the first game just wasn't capable of. Not to mention that most of the really useless sub-weapons for the first game were actually removed entirely and replaced with more interesting ones, like Wisp or the homing missiles. For the most part, you still have everything you need to be good, but it's going to take you longer to learn what's what, and the frequent introduction of new sub-weapons and enemies will stop combat from getting mundane. And this isn't even taking into account level design. The design team really went out of their way to make sure you were doing different things throughout almost the entirety of the game. By the time I'd noticed I'd already been playing the game for as long as it had taken me to beat Zone of the Enders 1, I'd already trucked through a canyon and a piece of crap mech, made my way through a space station searching for a trapped ally, got him out alive, explored the Martian landscape finding my way into a city, defended said city from Barum and Space Force troops, and stopped an enemy supply train. 
That was around one third of the time that it took me to beat the game, and it was certainly more enjoyable and varied than the entirety of the first game. But it's not just the beginning that has a variety of content. They didn't front load the game with memorable parts. Most of my favorite sections actually happen towards the end, with my favorite being the descending chambers at Lloyd's lab, though the battleship assault and war sequence are a lot of fun too. Getting back to the narrative, there's still one element of this game that's criminally bad. And that's the voice acting. It hasn't really improved all that much, but with Leo out of the spotlight, our main character is not nearly as irritating to listen to. That said, I feel as if even more of the dialogue was lost in translation this time around. Do you know that Ada intends to self-destruct Jahuti on Almon? Are you sure? It is true. Wait a second! What's going on? Whose order is that? It's a command which arose from the basis of a program. The basis of a program? Are you kidding me? Who would allow such a thing? Hey, Ada, I won't allow you to do that! I'm really shuddering to think how terrible Metal Gear or Silent Hill would have turned out if they'd gotten this type of translation treatment. But despite all this, I found the characters to be more likable this time around, mostly because they have motivations other than simply surviving the end of the game. There's a few twists and turns regarding Dingo and Ken's pasts that are appreciated, and some of the minor characters, like Taper, actually have personalities, unlike pretty much every supporting character from the first Zone of the Enders. I also find myself liking them more because of the shift in art direction. Zoe was always supposed to be a mech anime turned into a video game. Now it has fully animated cutscenes to make that parallel even clearer. Normally I'd always advocate for real-time cutscenes, but that likely wasn't an option, and I can't deny how much better these look than the last game's pre-renders. Characters are brighter and more expressive, and it makes the codex-style cockpit sequences much more entertaining to sit through now that we actually have something to look at. Which is good, because there are certainly more of them this time around. Rather than focusing almost entirely on themes of existence, Second Runner is primarily about the conflict on Mars, and like the last time, it's being viewed from the perspective of someone in between the two factions. That was probably the best way to show it, because it was still tough for me to see the big picture of the conflict. This time, it wasn't the vagaries, as the game does try to fill in some of the backstory of Bara. The issue is more that these are the final days of the war, so the events preceding them don't get much screen time because they're not as important. I think we really could have used more exposition though since this is a sequel and this conflict's been going on for two games now. It's important to understand as much as we can. Regardless, the player's going to get the gist that Baram's mighty fortress has put the Space Force and the local population on its knees, and the only thing with the potential to take it down is Jehuti, provided it gets a few new upgrades. It's straightforward enough, I suppose, but it gets a bit off the rails towards the end. When it's actually time to take down Aumon Fortress, the stakes are suddenly risen to totally unnecessary levels, when it's revealed that Noman's goals are to destroy the entirety of Mars rather than just the Space Force occupying it. Only ten minutes later, it's clarified that Aumon is powerful enough to destroy the entire solar system. I'm really not sure what the point of raising the stakes to absurd levels was other than to have Aumann one up the Death Star. As far as you know, Nomen's entire plan has been to get control of Mars from the Space Force and also any other factions on the planet. But then his motives shift to proving how the cutting edge technology he's using is so dangerous that it can lead to mankind's destruction. It doesn't really make much sense. It's like if the Manhattan Project was started not to win World War II, but just to prove that nuclear energy was dangerous, and then they proceeded to drop bombs all over the entire planet. I almost feel like the writers might have just been going for a cheap nukes are bad card, but at least this only comes up at the very end of the game. In the first game, all of the bosses were far larger than the player, while Nate was the only one that was roughly the same size as Jehuti. This time around, all of the bosses are roughly your size, and Zakat is the only one larger than the player. It makes boss fights feel much more like a duel. You can't just strafe around them with projectiles for a really long time. You gotta get up close and personal, so the melee combat really shines during the boss fights. They were all a lot more fun and memorable than the ones from the first game. Between Vic Viper's bombing runs, Inhurt's shadowy attacks, and Anubis' general one-upsmanship, each new frame that you fight brings something new to the table, both in combat and design. Even better, every boss except Zakat is an actual character in the story, which brings the game further to its intended anime feel. Although, if we're gonna talk about that anime feel, we should bring up these awkward tune-shading effects they tried with the smoke. 
They talked about it with a lot of pride in some interviews, but it really doesn't match the aesthetic at all. This isn't the Wind Waker. But getting back to the boss fights. There is one exception here, and that would be Neftis, which is fought five times during the first half of the game. Each time you use a different gimmick associated with grabbing to defeat it, and they're often so non-standard that every time the game has to stop and let Ada explain how to beat it. It's really patronizing and sets a false precedent that the game is going to be a cakewalk, which simply isn't true. The lowest point of all is the final Neftis fight, where the frame's AI possesses Arjet, which is the first boss of the game. I thought it was just going to be a harder version of that fight, but after experiencing this battle a few times, I would have much rather preferred a retread. All we have is yet another gimmick fight with an awful twist. You can only hurt the AI when you're grabbing it, but hurting the frame damages your ally inside. The boss is capable of doing massive damage to her, which can easily cost you the fight for seemingly no reason. Seriously, I tried testing it out, I have no idea what triggers it. All I know is that it ruins the fight completely. Cleverly, I think that the team took the frustration players must have felt at the fake-out final boss of the previous game and turned that into the central conflict of this game. Nomad is immediately set up to be the villain, and the superiority of Anubis is established along with it. They keep the fake-out fights going, believe it or not. There's actually three of them this time, but it works, because each time he shows up, you get a little closer to his level, and it all culminates in a very challenging and satisfying boss fight. It was all surprisingly cathartic and really left me feeling good when I overcame the final boss and saved the day. That's what video games are supposed to do, leave you feeling good and satisfied at the end. I think it's clear that Zone of the Enders 2 was a huge step in the right direction, even if it's not what the original creator may have intended the series to become. Like I said, the only thing better than a great game is a great sequel. It's their ability to learn from mistakes and capitalize on successes that has made a lot of sequels some of my favorite games of all time. And if we're going to grade this game like a sequel, then Zoe 2 is a fantastic one. It took something that people might have considered launch era trash and worked the miracle of turning it into something full of substance and entertainment. So with all that said, you might be wondering, why didn't the series continue? Why was there no more Zoe? Well, Second Runner just didn't sell as well as the first game, probably because it didn't have the demo for a critically acclaimed stealth game attached to it. It's really unfortunate that they weren't able to continue. To be honest, I'm not really sure where the story would have gone, since it kind of wraps up here, but it was fun as shit. I wanted to play more. That's probably why Kojima Productions was looking to revitalize the series by releasing HD versions of the games. It was even announced that a pre-production team had been formed for a possible third entry, revealing some rather intriguing concept art and even a Fox Engine render of the new Jehuti. But after two years with no new info, Kojima announced that the project had been terminated. Actually, I was really looking forward to uh, make, make the game, but uh, right now we're in the difficult, we're facing several difficulties. I, I'm uh, I don't have anyone that is in charge of that project, so around two years ago, actually, I was moving very seriously uh, towards uh, making the, this game happen, but right now, uh, we had several difficulties, and the game has uh, been uh, put as a project for the future. The official reason for this was the failure of the HD collection to get Zone of the Enders 2 to run at 60 frames per second like the first game does. I'm unsure as to why that would lead to the cancellation of an entirely different game being developed in the Cutting Edge Fox engine, which is capable of producing some of the best visuals I've ever seen. That brings me to my last point. I never felt a need to mention these supposed port issues because they really didn't stop me from enjoying the game. I certainly didn't like the frame dips and cutscenes, but I think that these are being caused by the game failing to recreate ghosting effects rather than genuine lag. It's simulated if that makes any sense. Most importantly, I had a smooth gameplay experience in combat even with a lower frame rate. Raw performance really doesn't matter if the experience blows, there's plenty of AAA games that can tell you that. From what I can see, it seems like a lot of hardcore Zone of the Enders fans are very mad with the way Konami treated the HD collection, but I have to say, the issues that it had really aren't that significant, especially when you compare it to a certain other HD collection Konami produced that's an utter mockery of the games it's supposedly porting. This collection is probably as close to a definitive version of these games as you're ever going to get, and considering that the PS3 version received a patch to mitigate these issues in Zone of the Enders 2, I don't really think there's much worth complaining about. 
More recently, Konami launched a poll asking fans what series they would like the company to start developing again. Metal Gear and Silent Hill were left off, probably because of all the Kojima controversy, but curiously, Zone of the Enders wasn't, even though I would say it has as much to do with him as Silent Hill does, if not more. Trying to leave my feelings about the controversy out of this, I would be willing to see another Zone of the Enders game, but I'm not sure I have faith in Konami to develop it properly. It likely wouldn't involve anyone from the previous team whatsoever, and while getting a new director on board seemed to work well, I'm not sure about an entirely fresh-faced staff. Plus, since Konami appears to be in the middle of downsizing their gaming division, I'm not sure they'd even have the manpower to make a proper Zone of the Enders game. I certainly wouldn't want to see a phone installment, or worse, a pachinko version. So there you have it, a two-part review on a pair of PS2 games. You might be wondering why of all the games to talk about, I picked these two. I didn't choose Zone of the Enders because I wanted to praise it embarrassingly or slam it like a man-child. I picked it because it's an extremely middle-of-the-road game with good and bad elements that are still interesting to discuss. I feel a lot of games like this often get lost in the sea of AAA marketing or general overhype. I've had the easiest time learning things from games that get the broad concept right but struggle with the details. That's not to say there isn't value in looking at masterpieces or travesties, but it's often harder to look at those as logically, because you've got some rather strong emotions about the material to chip past before you can do so. The next subject of review will probably be a middle-of-the-road game as well, and hopefully I can help you appreciate its efforts too. Eh, but I'm rambling at this point. See you around out there.